Jacksonville is in a lot of ways a pretty typical American city and probably the epitome of Floridian urban planning. It's a large, sprawled metro area that connects car-centric single-family home suburbs to an office space downtown. But unlike most of Florida, Jacksonville has some significant pre-1950s car-centric routes. It also has one of the country's more unique transport systems. Let's compare Jacksonville's Skyway failure to the broader history of the city. Jacksonville was named after this guy, and founded in 1822. It's located right around here. Like most American cities, it's heavily car dependent. 90% of its residents take a car to work, and only 2% use public transport. But Jacksonville actually has one of America's most unique transport systems. It's called the Skyway. It's not really a tram, a monorail, or heavy rail. It's what's known as an automated people mover. Originally, it was recommended that the system be 4.6 miles long with 14 stations. The Jacksonville Skyway was expected to fit into a much larger 30 plus mile fixed guideway transit network that would serve the larger metro area. Of course, not all things go according to plan, but how far off the mark did Jacksonville's 60s and 70s transit dreams fall? Of the 14 stations, only 8 were built. The 4.6 miles ended up being only 2.5. Three stations were built in the south bank of the river, and five were built on the other side. The system was built in phases, the first phase being under a mile long. It ran from downtown to the convention center. Ten years after this segment was completed, the Skyway's final and current route was done. In the year 2000, 25 years after the planning began and 10 years after building started, the system reached its full length. Ridership also never saw its intended numbers. It was projected to carry over 50,000 passengers per day, but that number ended up being closer to 5,000. So the question is, what happened? One way to understand why Jacksonville Skyway didn't meet expectations is by looking at the history of the city and how its urban development played out. Jacksonville in the early 1900s was a lot different than it is today. After a disastrous fire in 1901, the city quickly rebuilt itself and started attracting Americans from all over the country. It had a dense urban core and interconnected neighborhoods where you could find Chinese, Filipino, Greek, and Italian communities, as well as one of the most prosperous black communities in the South. By the 1940s, the population had grown to almost 200,000. This growth was matched by growing economic importance. It boasted a silent film industry until the 1920s. The Florida land boom also gave the city a lot of attention, but that boom turned into a bust. Nonetheless, its natural harbors made it a prime location for the US Navy and private shipping. The city was also a rail hub. It connected the country to the rest of Florida and 20,000 passengers passed through its main station every single day. Just west of downtown was La Villa. This neighborhood was called the Harlem of the South. It was a confluence of black culture which influenced the entire country. Just north of La Villa was Sugar Hill. This was a middle and upper class black neighborhood. Despite being in the Jim Crow era South, these neighborhoods thrived. At its peak, it had 600 black owned businesses, including theaters, banks, insurance companies, streetcar companies, and hotels. La Villa was a cultural hotspot. Blues and jazz musicians from all over the country went there to perform. Okay, so Jacksonville, the Skyway, black neighborhoods. You might be thinking to yourself, how is this all connected? Well, there is one piece of the pie that ties it all together, and you might know where I'm going with this. Jacksonville's redlining and segregation are one of the biggest reasons the Skyway failed. Redlining is one of those topics some people learn about in school, and by learn about, I mean it's a vocab word for a random test, and then the topic never comes up again. In reality, it might be one of the most consequential policies the United States government ever supported. This extremely racist and classist policy laid the foundation for the type of metro areas Americans inhabit now, those that are segregated and sprawled. 
The death of Jacksonville's traditional urban core caused by racist local and national policy is one of the main reasons the Skyway failed, and the multi-decade decline of downtown and the surrounding neighborhoods was not going to be saved by a half-built system. Jacksonville was not spared from the effects of redlining. La Villa and Sugar Hill were both redlined. Zones marked with yellow were considered to be inhabited by a lower grade population. Zones in red were definitely hazardous and that investment would be a risk. Throughout the US, these red line zones were areas where mostly African American, Jewish American, or any sort of immigrant population lived. In Jacksonville, this red lined area coincided precisely with what the first zoning map of the city called unrestricted. And the cherry on top of the cake urban highways. With the end of the war and massive federal investment, the government endorsed and continues to endorse a subsidization of suburban living. In Jacksonville, this meant previously drawn on boundaries between race and class now became physical concrete barriers. Any sort of focus on walkability or the human scale was ignored and the focus was turned to the personal automobile. Jacksonville became encased in a system of highways that were touted as urban renewal. The black neighborhoods in town were physically split. I-95 now runs through the middle of La Villa in what used to be Sugar Hill. This aerial is from the 50s. It shows I-95 shortly after construction. Here's two side-by-side -side aerials. On the left, La Villa and Sugar Hill in the 90s, and on the right, the same neighborhood in the 40s. You might have to pause to see the difference. Almost everything is gone. Running I-95 through the middle of these neighborhoods cut them off from the rest of the city. The damage is most obvious in what used to be Sugar Hill. Houses and buildings were flattened by the highway or abandoned and turned into swaths of parking. Now, while these aerials focus on La Villa and Sugar Hill, really the effect of these urban highways happened to most neighborhoods in the city. The style of development prevalent throughout the country after the 40s is very different to how cities grew before. Jacksonville's original streetcar system shows this well. Its streetcars reached all of the city's outskirts and a person could go from the edge of town to the center in 30 minutes. Like most cities though, the system was torn down to make room for the car. It's easy to see why the city's investment in a downtown people mover failed. The city's overall population kept rising, but the area where the system was built was being depopulated. Between 1950 and 2020, the 30 square mile urban core went from having 200,000 residents to 100,000. City leaders saw this trend and decided to consolidate the city and county in the 1960s. What used to be an urban core with a mix of housing, businesses, industry, and entertainment served by a large streetcar network turned into parking lots and office space. The Skyway's problem was that it was not really intended to serve a local population. It was envisioned as part of a much larger system which would feed it riders and truly connect it to the entire city. But this never materialized. Policy decisions over the last 50 years, though, have driven people out of the urban core and continue to incentivize driving into it. Instead of using the Skyway as a catalyst to revitalize the urban core, policy in the city county has mostly focused on the suburbs. Thus, the Jacksonville Skyway has been dubbed the train to nowhere. The ultimate urban circulator, or U2C for short, is the city's answer to the Skyway's problems. The vision is to turn the Skyway into an autonomous shuttle, Although in its early stages, relatively speaking, the plan for the U2C is straightforward. Replace the Skyway with a driverless 10 to 15 person capacity shuttle. This means using the Skyway's right of way, elevated routes, along with introducing the shuttle to mixed traffic at ground level and expanding the system's overall route. Instead of opting for a street cart, light rail or bus rapid transit system, or even expanding the Skyway, the city's policymakers are being bold and looking to alternative proposals. Kind of like what they did in the 1970s. Estimates are rising, but the cost is looking to be somewhere in the ballpark of $400 million. Jacksonville's traditional urban core is seeing changes. There's definitely more of a focus towards building density than there was in the past. Only time will tell if policymakers will make the right decisions that can benefit future residents and make a less car-centered model of living.